Hey there! Let's go ahead and take a look at a cool and brand new feature added to the Roblox API called Generalized Shape Casting. Now you've probably heard of the term ray casting, which is the process of firing a ray in a particular direction and checking to see if that ray hit anything. This can be useful in many systems, like for calculating bullet impacts with guns and the like, but what if we wanted to be able to scan a whole area and check for collisions? This is where we can utilize shape casting, which is the process of taking an entire part and its shape and casting it in a particular direction and detecting when it collides with another part. You can think of shape casting as ray casting, but with volume. This can be incredibly useful when you need to sweep an entire area and check for collisions. Instead of having to fire multiple rays to check an area, you can do the same process with a single part. Last year, Roblox introduced two functions for the purpose of shape casting, which were block cast and sphere cast, but they only allowed you to shape cast using a block or a sphere. So in May of 2023, their article states, you may know these as swept volume queries, thick ray casts, continuous collision detection, or various other names across the industry, we call them shape casts. Shape casts are closely related to ray casts. Ray casts push a point along a line, while shape casts push a 3D space and find the first hit point. So this is ray casting, but with volume. If we take a look at the API for this, the block cast and the sphere cast functions take a C frame, which represents the position and rotation of a particular volume, as well as the size of that volume, the direction to move that volume, as well as any additional raycast parameters. And this will return a raycast result, which stores the position, which represents the intersection between the hit part and the swept shape, the normal, which is the normal vector of the face that was hit, and then the distance represents how far the shape had to travel. And it says the final position of the swept shape can be found as the direction. So we get a unit vector of that, which is a vector of a length of one stud. And we multiply that by the results distance, which is how far our swept shape actually had to move before it hit something. And by offsetting the position of our part with this additional calculation, we are able to position our part in this particular manner, where instead of the entire part being positioned at where we hit, instead it gets offset so that way it matches up to whatever point on our particular shape hit another object. Now just three days ago, Roblox released another new function for generalized shape casts. And generalized shape casts allow you to cast any arbitrary part into the world. Blocks, spheres, cylinders, wedges, CSG, which is for unions and mesh parts and so on. So this allows you to take any part in any shape and cast it in a particular direction. And they say, we previously released block casts and sphere casts as ways to find collisions using swept shapes. These can be thought of as ray casts with volume. Until today, shape casts were limited to block and sphere shapes, which limited their usefulness. Even if you started with a block or sphere shape part, you couldn't simply plug the part into the shape cast query. As we saw earlier, you had to copy over the C frame as well as the size for a particular shape. But now with this new shape cast function, which belongs to the world root, so this is either a function for the workspace or any world model instances, you pass the part, which is going to be the thing we need to shape cast, the direction, as well as ray cast parameters, and it will return to us a ray cast result. In their example video here, it shows them with a torus or a donut, and they move the donut along a line, and there's another donut below, and it sets its position equal to whatever was shape casted by this top donut. So as you can see, when he moves around, it is reacting to the environment and making sure it does not clip into or collide with any of the terrain in the map, which is very, very cool. Now a statement on performance, they say, performance is acceptable for smaller cast sizes, but large casts against dense worlds can be pretty slow. We plan to optimize this with our ongoing broad phase work. So yes, shape casting is going to be more expensive to calculate than simple ray casting, but if you have use cases where it would make more sense to shape cast rather than using ray casting, then you can go ahead and use shape casting. So I think the best way to demonstrate shape casting is to just recreate this example that Roblox gave in their dev forum post. So we'll have a top torus and a bottom torus. And as we move the top torus, the bottom torus is going to move along with it, but it's going to shift up and down to make sure it does not clip into or collide into the environment. So inside of studio, here I have my first torus and my second torus. This one's named mesh one, and this is my mesh number two. And the plan is, as we move this part along with the move tools, we want to move this bottom torus along with the top torus. 
And as we are shape casting this top torus downwards, we want to adjust the position of this torus to reflect the collision when we're shape casting downwards from the position of this part right here. So let's go ahead and create a new script in service script service. And let's go ahead and make a reference to our first part, which is workspace.mesh1. And then we'll get the other part or the other torus, which is workspace.mesh2. And then I'm also going to define some raycast parameters for the shape cast. So raycast params.new. And this is because we want to make sure we exclude our first part and our other part within the shape cast calculations. So we'll do params.filter descendant instances, and that's going to be equal to a table with our first part and our second part. And then we can go ahead and set the filter type equal to the enum.filter type or raycast filter type of exclude. And now what we can go ahead and do is we can listen for when our first part or our first torus has its property position changed. So we'll get property change signal past the position and we'll connect a function to this. And every single time the position of our part changes, we want to go ahead and perform a shape cast operation. So let's go ahead and refer to the workspace and use the function of shape cast. So we need to pass our part, the direction we want to shape cast and the raycast parameters for the shape cast. So that part is going to be our first part. The direction is going to be down. And the way we can grab that is that the up direction for our donut is going to be that way, which is the up vector. So if we want to get the opposite of the up vector, we can use the urinary operator or the urinary minus operator to invert the up vector. So now we'll get the down vector. So let's go ahead and refer to the parts C frame, get its up vector, and then we'll use the urinary minus operator to invert it. And then we can go ahead and multiply this by a magnitude, let's say 500 studs. So it's going to shape cast 500 studs in the downward direction. And then we can go ahead and pass our raycast parameters. Now this should return to us a raycast result if it hits something. So if we get a result, then clearly we've collided with some kind of part or terrain. So let's go ahead and update the position of our second part to reflect that. Now you might think that, oh, okay, let's just go ahead and set the other parts position equal to the position we get in the result. But there's an issue with that. And that's because this position just represents where the collision point was at. And you got to think that the origin is inside of the center of our part. Let's say the collision point was over here. Well, if we try to position our part over on the other side, we're going to run into a weird issue where our part is not going to be positioned correctly and it's going to be clipping into other objects. So actually, let's go ahead and demonstrate this. If we run the game with the current code that we have, and then I were to go and move this top torus, you're going to see that our part is jumping around all over the place. And that's because it's jumping around to the different collision points that is being detected. So there it jumps over here and you can see that is clipping through this part. This is not the result that we want. This looks awful. This is terrible. If you remember back inside of the dev form post, they have told us that we can grab the final position of the swept shape by offsetting the position by the direction that we've raycasted in multiplied by the actual distance we traveled before we hit something. So let's go ahead and implement this inside of Studio. So let me make a variable and I'm going to call this my origin position. So this is the actual position we want to set for our second part. And that's going to be equal to our first part's position. And then we want to offset this by another vector in the direction that we've raycasted, which is the opposite of the up vector. And then we want to multiply that value by the actual distance we traveled before we hit something, which is going to be equal to the result dot distance. Now we're going to have a correct position to set our other parts position to. So if we swap this out and paste the origin position, and now if we go and run the game, take a look at what happens. If we start moving it, as you can see, now our part is not shifting around all over the place to different positions of where we've collided, but instead it is flush with the surface because this is the point where we've like, okay, we've collided, let's not go down any further. And then once we hit this part over here, boom, it detects that there was a collision point right here and we've positioned our donut accordingly. And we can move it across and then it'll go down as it detects no more collision and then it'll hit the ground, very cool. Now let's also go ahead and visualize this point of collision. And the easiest way we could do that is just by creating a small sphere part and setting the position of that sphere part equal to the result dot position. So let's go ahead and make a new part up here. I'm going to call this part my collision point, and that's equal to instance.new part. 
We'll make sure to anchor this part. I'm going to set the color of the part equal to white. So one, one, one. And then we're also going to go ahead and set the shape equal to the enum dot part type of a ball. So it's a sphere. For the size, we could just do a vector 3.new of 0.5 by 0.5 by 0.5 studs. For the material, I want to make it pop out and stand out. So we'll set it to the enum of material neon. And then I also want to make sure that this part does not interfere with our shape cast operation. So in order to do that, we're going to set the collision point dot can collide equal to false. And then we're also going to set the collision point part dot can query equal to false. So that way it's not included in our shape cast calculations. And then finally, we can go ahead and set the parent of this equal to the workspace. And then every single time we are shape casting, we're going to go ahead and update this collision points position equal to the result dot position. And then in order to see this collision point, let's go ahead and change the transparency of our second torus. We'll just do other part dot transparency and set that to a value of like, let's say 0.8. And there's our transparent torus on the bottom. So you can imagine that as our shape casted volume or part. And as we start moving this top one around, there you can see our little white ball and it's telling us each one of the points that it is intersecting in every single time our top torus moves. So when I move it, okay, that is the collision point right there that it detected. If I move it again, there's the other collision point that it detected. And then eventually as I get it close enough to this part, boom, there we go. It detected a collision right on the edge of this part with our torus. And it's like, okay, let's stop right here. We've collided with something. And then as I move it along, there you can see the collision point updating for our torus and then it shifts to the other side because there's nothing colliding over here. And then eventually we'll hit that edge one more time and then we'll hit the ground. Very cool. Now this cylinder right here should perfectly fit inside of the hole of our donut. So let's go ahead and move it over. As you can see, it's colliding with the edge of our cylinder and we can keep moving it. And then eventually, boom, fits perfectly right through the center of our donut. And we can keep moving our torus here and eventually our donut is going to hit this ramp and now you can see the collision point on this ramp and as we continue to move it up the collision point follows now if i rotate this as you can see we're going to have a little bit of a different problem here and that's because it's shape casting this part with this orientation but since our ghost part right here doesn't match the orientation it's looking a little bit wonky so what we can go ahead and do is every single time the position updates, let's go ahead and also make sure that we match the rotation of our first part to the other part. And that's very easy to do. We can just refer to other part dot rotation and set it equal to our parts rotation. And then another thing we can go ahead and account for is if we didn't hit anything at all. If we didn't hit anything at all, then let's go ahead and just move our second part 500 studs in the direction that we are shape casting. So we can do other part dot position that's going to be equal to the original parts position plus our direction which is this multiply by 500 and then we'll also make sure to match the rotation here as well so part dot rotation so now if i rotate my donut here as you can see the rotation of my other donut is matching and now we are colliding with this part right here and then i can move my part up and down and there you can see each of the individual collision points every single time we move our donut. So now we're colliding with this part and eventually we'll hit the edge right there. We'll keep hitting that edge until eventually, boom, our donut goes down and then we hit this part. And then let's say we fire the ray off into the abyss. There you go, now our donut is super far away, 500 studs away because that was the max distance for our shape cast. And since we're not colliding with anything else, as you can see the position of this guy right here is not being updated. But once we come back and start colliding with another part, there you go. The position of that little part is being updated. So as you can see, shape casting is very unique and may help you solve problems in your code. You can use shape casting for all kinds of things, such as maybe you wanna create a view cone for an AI to see if they're able to see a player, or maybe you wanna create some kind of advanced collision detection system and a whole bunch of other stuff you could possibly do with shape casting. Virtually the possibilities are endless. 
Now, all you need to know is that, yes, shape casting is going to be more complicated to calculate compared to ray casting. So if you can solve an issue using ray casting and you don't need to use shape casting, then just use ray casting. Don't use shape casting. Other than that, the main thing you should take away from this video is that shape casting isn't complicated. It's literally just ray casting, but with volume. So go have fun in studio, mess around with shape casting, and I'll see you in the next one.